The day he met his father, within a week, his chest pain had completely gone. Like completely, like just poof, gone. And he met the doctor again, the same doctor from the hospital, to thank him for referring me him to me. And and the doctor emailed me. I still remember that. And he said, I have no idea what you did. And this is fascinating. And I want to come and try a session with you. Welcome to the Everglow, a podcast with real advice you can actually use to live a better, happier life, especially if you're an empath. No burning sage, no crystals, no BS. Join me as I travel the world sharing the valuable lessons I learned. Hit subscribe on iTunes or wherever it is that you're listening to this to get new episode updates. So I kept hearing about this thing called Reiki. So much so that one day I decided to try it for myself. And you know what? I think it actually worked. So today, we're going to interview Manali, a Reiki master, so you can learn a little bit about it too. All right, welcome to the latest episode of The Everglow. I have a special guest once again this week, our second guest ever. Her name is Manali and she hails from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, my hometown, even though I don't live there anymore. Uh, so today's a special episode, not only because it's Manali, but also because, as you guys know, this podcast is about self-improvement, being an empath, how to live a happier life. And guess what? Manali is a Reiki master. So we're going to hear from her today. You have a real life Reiki master, and it's going to be a fun conversation because you're going to learn about Reiki what it's all about. And it'll be an interesting contrast because as you know, the gimmick of my show is, you know, it's self-improvement without all the BS, no no burning sage, no crystals, no nothing. Uh, But I know Reiki encompasses some of that. So we can kind of challenge Manali and learn along the way. So welcome to the show, Manali. Thank you so much. I'm uh, really excited to be here. Hey, the pleasure is hopefully ours. So Manali and I met about five or six years ago, I was going through some personal issues and I had lost a girl and I decided to deploy every asset I could to try to get her back. And through a mutual friend, a mutual friend, Manali and I met, and I thought she could do some psychic kind of stuff to give me some insight on getting the girl back. And guess what? It, it, it worked at the time. So Manali, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and we can go from there. All right, man. I mean, I'm originally from Mumbai, uh, you know, India, and I was born and brought up there and pretty much never imagined in my entire life that time growing up that I'm actually going to come to North America. Uh, I used to always joke, you know, to my parents uh, because I used to like wearing some Western clothes and, you know, some tight, like fitting jeans. And my dad used to always like remind me, hey, Manali, this is India. This is not North America. And, you know, guess what? I mean, 2005, uh, I moved to Canada, Ottawa, for a better life for myself and my daughter. That time she was uh, just about five and a half years old. And, uh, you know, I had gone through a separation from a previous marriage. So it was like a fresh start in my head. And I remember me always joking to my dad, you know, after I reached Canada, that, hey, dad, now I'm in North America. I can wear whatever I want. Uh, Anyway, my journey began with that whole, uh, I guess, let's get out of the box and, and, uh, you know, bring some of the things I love and believe to this uh, side of the town and uh, inspire people and, and share share some cool uh, techniques with them. Very cool. And you know, it's, it's interesting because I always thought Reiki, when I'd hear the term, because, you know, Reiki is often associated with meditation and self-help stuff. I always thought Reiki was mm-hmm. an Indian thing. I just assumed that, right? Because everybody's always adopting these Indian techniques in terms of meditation and no. whatever, but it's not, Reiki is not actually an Indian thing, right? It actually belongs from Japan, right? And there's a whole story about it. Uh, you know, when I teach courses, I tell the story, but, you know, just for people to get a little hang of it. So Reiki comes from Japan and there was this, uh, the, the founder of Reiki, he was a surgeon. His name is, uh, was Dr. Usui. And, uh, Dr. Usui, in his initial years in Japan, was all about medical, you know, anatomy and, you know, the proper, uh, you know, uh, ways of treating people was just through medicine. And I think in his journey as a surgeon and a doctor, he also realized that 
sometimes he used to touch people, you know, where it was hurting or the pain was there and they used to be healed, like pain was gone. And he had no explanation about it because he was so scientific about the, you know, his, his schooling as a doctor. Um, and I think basically, you know, in his journey, um, it's a long story, but long story short, in his journey, he went to this mountain uh, called Mountain Kurama and in Japan, and he meditated there for about 21 days to find some answers. And, you know, it's just like any spiritual leader story we hear. Uh, Dr. Usui got some enlightenment, you know, he got some, uh, I guess, knowledge uh, about certain symbols that can heal people. And uh, how energy can be transported, you know, uh, without the person being in front of you, uh, based on just intentions and uh, a goodwill for that person. So basically, that's how Reiki got originated. And he started sharing it with his, with his other doctor, fellow friends, who became his Reiki students. And eventually, it came to North America, and it went to all countries. Like right now, every country, not just India has Reiki practitioners and it's become one of the modalities of energy healing and uh, I guess balancing your energy centers and chakras. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. And so you moved from just to backtrack a bit, as you can see, I'm a bit all over the map because we don't usually have great guests like you. Um, you moved from Mumbai to Canada and did you get into, first of all, how did you decide to get into Reiki and did you get into Reiki after coming to Canada or before? It was before, and actually that was not my primary profession. So originally, I'm like a certified nutritionist. I've done my master's in uh, clinical nutrition. So I used to be working with cancer patients, you know, in the Mumbai city, I was working in hospitals. And then I even did my master's in sports nutrition. So I was working with athletes, bodybuilders, gyms. So it was only like nutrition was my forte, okay, for many, many years as a professional. On that point, uh, wh- what prompted you to parlay your way over to learning Reiki? What what stimulated you to do that? So as I said, my main focus as a professional for earning money was nutrition, right. correct? Yep. But, but since the age of 15, actually, no, it's earlier, probably since the age of 12, I started, I used to get messages. Like I used to get, you know, it's like a future tense messages about like my intuition, uh, like, let's say my mom wants, you know, wanted to go to the market for buying something and it was not a city holiday. And I used to tell her, hey, mom, that shop is going to be closed. And, you know, in the beginning, nobody used to really believe me. She used to go to the market. The shop was closed. And it, it started, these coincidences were really happening. And I had no idea why I knew things beforehand. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think I remember when I was 15, I'd gone for a Himalayan high altitude trekking expedition it was like a 15,000 feet uh, 15 days high altitude hiking in a mountaineering experience and uh, when I reached the summit I still remember I was you know at 15,000 feet I reached the summit I dropped my backpack off and I was just sitting there and for five minutes I was meditating which I didn't even know that time that I was it, it is called meditation one of my instructors asked me Manali do you meditate and I said oh, what is that this is med-. and he told me this is meditation so after that expedition, I started digging a little bit more into these realms, basically. That's where it began, the interest. And I came across Reiki as a modality through some friend who had done it, and she was really saying, wow, this is fabulous. Uh, and I think at the age of 16, I did my first Reiki course as a hobby. And then by the age of uh, 20, I was, a, I was a Reiki master teacher in India, uh, they, you know, at that young age. And still it was a hobby. Um, till I think I actually uh, probably by the time I was 25, 26, I started healing more and more people. Uh, but again, non-professionally, you know, friends, relatives, uh, just doing some community like healing, uh, just to practice. Uh, so yeah, so I think I think my Himalaya connection is, is deep, where I felt the spiritual calling almost, you know, that I need to go deeper. And I remember after the age of fifteen, I did lots of different things: meditation courses, Reiki, the, you know, everything going towards the same direction, like yoga, you know, finding the answers about what's beyond the body, you know, what what's beyond our conscious mind. Yeah, so that's where it began. 
Okay, great. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, because you you hear about Reiki, but then I don't know. I feel like a lot of the things out there don't go into the depths of what it's all about. People tend to, myself included, throw it into the lump or the pile of, oh, it's something to do with meditating and, you know, Eastern Eastern medicine, I suppose. But it's mm-hmm, unlike absolutely. a lot, of, unlike yoga and maybe unlike uh, meditating, it actually has a lot of, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like it has a lot more facets to it. So it's not just, it's healing, but then it still encompasses the whole, you know, nutrition, meditating. It still encompasses all those things, right? It's, it's a broad thing or am I incorrect? Oh, yeah, absolutely correct. See, the, the three words that are floating around, right, when we go online and to research any Zen stuff, right? The three words are what? Mind, body, and spirit, correct? Kind of. That's what's right. rolling these days. And if you really look at these three words, the mind is all about our conscious mind usually, like our thoughts, day-to-day, how we are emotionally, moods, energies, you know, like sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're sad, sometimes you're angry. It's all in the mind, right? Conscious mind. And the body is receiving the signals from our mind because some of the symptoms I notice when people come to me are emotional symptoms, shoulder pain, neck pain, back pain. It's not always, let's say, medical-related symptoms. You know, even some doctors actually believe that there are psychosomatic disorders because every report is normal in some patients. Then what? Then why the symptoms? It's an emotional pain. Right, yeah. So that's the, that's the body part of it, right? And the spirit... It's a very generalized word, but spirit goes to the land of yoga in a way and meditations and reikis where spirit is of our energy, you know, our energy centers. Uh, spirit is all about how strong is our electromagnetic field around us. That's the scientific term, right? I, I like to call it aura, you know, or energy blanket. But basically, our body is sending out signals every single moment and that's the electromagnetic field so two people you know two people when they meet each other you know i'm sure you hear this a lot like you know somebody says you know i don't like the vibes of that person right. the good vibe yeah. bad vibe right so what's the vibe it's like the two people's energy field is meeting somewhere the signals are going even without saying a word you know what i mean and that's the electromagnetic field connection and Sometimes some people just make us calm. You know, you're just around a person and you feel so relaxed. How come? It's the energy part. So all these three elements, as you correctly said, are integrated. There is no separate thing to it because if consciously we are not positive, you know, those affirmations people say, mindfulness stuff, right? How can we relax our body? And then if our body and mind are not in the sink and relaxed and positive, how can our internal stuff, the energy, in, internally speaking, or chakras or all that other realm of deep conscious be relaxed, you know, so it's all connected. No, it's true. And, you know, over the decades I've been around, you know, people do always use the term, oh, this place has a bad vibe or I don't like that guy's energy. And I, I, I think they, they're not even spiritual people saying it. But I don't think they even realize the gravity of what they're saying, that they're, they literally do mean they don't like that person's vibe. And you hear it from people that you wouldn't expect to hear it from, like because those, that term is used so frequently. But maybe, maybe they're just really adept to feeling p- people, even though maybe they're not adept to other things in their life. Like I used to put up with people that I thought didn't have good vibes. And I used to hang out with them, even though I didn't like them because I thought I had to. And I didn't like their vibes. But, I, you know, these people that can just quickly sense somebody's vibes and walk away. I mean, they may be idiots in other areas of their lives, but they're very wise for just walking away from that bad energy. So, so you know, I believe that we all have a gut feeling, correct? Right. I mean, you don't have to be a Reiki master for that. Let's, let's get that straight. And, and I think uh, that gut feeling, you know, whichever depth of understanding you have about your energies or all these topics, the basic gut feeling is every human being has it. But you know what? It's not a good idea. It's a good idea. This is not a good white person, but this is a good person. Like that basic guidance we keep getting each and every time, consciously in our mind, you know. Uh, some people kind of follow that 
guideline and actually make a decision based on it, right? It's like a warning. They, they're getting that message beforehand that, hey, this is not a good guy to do business with, let's say, you know, or this is not a good relationship. And some people really, really intuitively listen to that gut feeling and some don't and that's fine and that's the process of learning right we all learn from our mistakes so yes i mean at the end of the day i believe that all of us have that gift called the gut feeling and i think intuition uh is all about training that muscle of trusting the gut feeling that's it you know and i think kids are good like that because when you're a kid you know, they sense everything and they know if something's uh, a person's bad, just like a dog does. But then I think what happens too is society tends to mold us in another direction where we have our gut feeling, which is natural, but then education teaches us to analyze, analyze everything. And so instead of just reacting from our gut, which is also helpful, uh, we also pr then process our experiences and our encounters through our brain and our brain says, well, this person has no criminal record. He hasn't done anything wrong with me, even though I, he gives me the heebie jeebies, let me still hang out with him. But more, more often than not, your, your initial reaction was, or your initial gut feeling was correct. Once that person, you know, stabs you in the back or whatever. And to be honest, like there's a reason why the kids, you know, have that ability is because number one, their energy or electromagnetic fields and their chakras, whatever, you know, you go down deep down, is, is very much open because less conditionings are there, as you correctly said, right? And as we grow up, we are, go through those conditionings. This is good. This is not good, you know, uh, right from our parents. And it goes on to our teachers, right? And everybody's trying to tell us their so-called mantra about life, right? Uh, and I feel that a, that a point comes in, in our life as an adult when we need to now keep all that aside that people have told us and go deeper within ourselves to find our own reality answers. And whether you do it through stuff like spiritual stuff, like Reiki or meditations or yoga, or you do it just with simple psychology and conscious mind techniques, at the end of the day, I think we need to definitely go deeper and find out what really works for us, keeping everything aside that people have taught, taught us. You know, it's almost like unconditioning ourselves. No, it's true. It's like this uh, asymptote, well, not asymptote, but it's like a a cosine or some sort of wave, mathematical wave where you start off really at, in tune with your surroundings and then you get conditioned feeling another way. And then in your 30s or 40s, you have to unwind that conditioning to start just listening to your gut again. It's kind of weird like that. So, and I'll tell you something as parents, like whoever is listening, and if you have, you know, kids, I think the conditioning or the deconditioning rather has to begin way before the 40s, you know? So, so kids who are 19, 18, 19 onwards, if, the, if parents can just give the freedom and of choice to their children, right, to, to explore within themselves what works for them and what doesn't work for them, that's the right age for such awareness to expand is, is what I've noticed, at least in many, many teenagers now, that if, if they start early, by the time they're in their 30s, they're pretty much sorted out human beings. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, because you, you would think that a kid in their, their late teens or even mid-teens is like, uh, it would have parents worried about them doing drugs and hanging around with the wrong, wrong people. So. I would think a parent would start pushing them in their own direction and the kid rebels and who knows what if you just leave them to their own devices. I tell you from my personal experience, because my daughter, now she's 20 years old, right? But, but since 18 onwards, I realized that she had questions about all these things. And, you know, I never pushed anything on her, but on her own, she wanted to explore, right? She had questions and I, I, I just gave her some ideas like, hey, try this you know, free app for meditation, for example, right? And, and just left her with that basics. And, and I think as her now journey has evolved, she has learned Reiki from me. I mean, that's, I'm, I was very honored to teach her actually. And she's a very regular um, attendee from my meditation classes. So I feel her life, I can see it so much evolved at this age just because of her own uh, practices and her own uh, finding her own answers 
And I think we need to give that space to our children, definitely, at a certain point, release, you know, the pressure and let them be for who they want to be. I mean, some guidance, of course, from our, from our side as parental guidance, yeah. No, good advice, good advice. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing in Ottawa. Now, Manali, you have a, a, a business that is directly involved with Reiki. So tell us the name of your business and exactly what you do as part of that. Yeah, my business is called Zen for You, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, located like as, as a office location. I have a studio in Ottawa, City, Canada, and uh, that's just for the local people, you know, who come to my studio. Uh, and as a part of my business, I think I specialize in filling up the gaps for people's journeys, which means you know, whoever, whichever stage a person is stuck, you know, it could be. Some people come to me for spiritual uh, healing, right, where I use Reiki techniques uh, and some other techniques in my basket for healing. Some people come to me for meditation, yoga, so that's where I wear my hat as a spiritual coach. And other part of my services is the wellness coach where people actually come for some lifestyle tune-ups. You know, they, they already are doing great. Some people, are, you know, they want them to go a little further, right, for what's next for their fitness and wellness. Uh, and I also, people kind of come to me for detoxes, like natural, naturopathy-based detoxes. So kind of people pick my brain uh, for spiritual coaching or wellness coaching. And other than Ottawa Studio, uh, I do a lot of virtual uh, online coaching for clients who are not based in Ottawa. So I, I think, yeah, I think uh, I definitely enjoy dividing my time for the local crowd, uh, you know, who might meet in person. And for all those people whom I meet all over the world who, who love and who love to enjoy their energy healing because, you know, energy travels. I don't need the person in front of me. And they really feel the, the power of the session, even at a long distance. Like I have clients in Australia, Lebanon, and the distance really doesn't matter. No, it's true. And I'll, I'll, we can talk about how we met again, and I'll tell the audience my story. So we'll, we'll mention your website at the end of the show, but do you want to just quickly say it now too, in case anybody wants to check it out? The website is zenforyou.ca. So Z-E-N-F-O-R-Y-O-U dot C-A. So that's the website. And, uh, you know, when people go in there, there's a lot of freebies. So, you know, People uh, can go to my services page and they have a free chakra assessment session. They can book. It's a short 20-minute session so people can actually just talk to me, ask some questions, and I can give them some feedback about what I think, how they are, you know, how, how, how their energies are, how their chakras are. So this is a fun 20-minute intro session. And there's also a free ebook. So, yeah, hope people enjoy the freebies. All right, cool. It would be fun for the audience to talk about how, how we met again. So I, I touched on it briefly at the outset, but we met under interesting circumstances. Do you remember that? It was what? Was it 2013, yeah. I think? 2014? Actually, yeah, I think 2013, 2014, yeah. Something, yeah. So yeah, I remember that, actually. Yeah, I remember that. Too. Uh, yeah, I was desperate. So I had gone through a uh, somewhat temporary breakup. I won't get into the logistics of all of it, but uh, let's just say I got busted and I really wanted to get the girl back. And, you know, one thing about me is when I want something, like I'm a generally relaxed guy, you know, I wake up whenever I do whatever I feel like, but when I want something, I have a very obsessive personality that way. Like if I decide I want a $10 million house, not that I have one or want one, I trust me, I'll get it. I'll figure out a way to do it. And so in this case, I'd lost this girl and I deployed every fucking resource I could have to get this girl. I had three very close, four very close friends of mine counseling with me, going, counseling me. We were going over strategies hours every day, every night of letters we could write, what to put in the letters. Like I had one of my closest friends here in LA, Orange County, who, you know, law degree, Berkeley undergrad, PhD. I had my other friend, Peely, you know, partnered a big law firm, two degrees. I, I, I probably had about a total of 15, you know, PhD, master's degree, law degrees, and me working to get this girl back. And it's, so it, right, at, right at the outset, she didn't, ha she didn't stand a chance, right? Because <laughs> I, I had a whole think tank. Uh -huh. I had a whole think tank. But yeah. when you want something and you, have to, you tell the universe you want it, you have to throw everything at the wall. And it doesn't matter if none of them work. If the universe sees you trying, it'll meet you halfway or more than halfway. And so 
I was doing the, the cerebral assassin angle of like trying to, you know, win her back. But I, th I didn't want to leave any stone unturned. So my friend, Samantha, who's our mutual friend in Ottawa, she introduced me to Manali and Manali had some special powers, let's just say, according to Samantha. Now huh. I didn't have time to be skeptical because I didn't really care. And frankly, with all the law of attraction things that I've seen in my life, there really wasn't anything I didn't really believe in at that point. So I thought even if Manali could give 1% of advice, let me, let me pipe into her. So do you, I guess I don't, do you remember our first phone call Manali? Like basically I, I had the belief that somehow Manali through her special powers, and I'm not necessarily saying these are Reiki powers. You can touch on that Manali. I thought that somehow you could tap in through the ethos, tap into that girl's brain to see what she was thinking. So I can adapt my strategy thoughts. Yes. Yes. I remember that. Yeah. I remember the first call. Yeah. Yeah, so I was just like, oh my God, like, what is she thinking? Because, you know, she was, she had gone radio silent on me, not Manali, but the girl had gone radio silent on me. So I was, I was trying to figure out what to do. And so we, we basically had a, not a seance, like, what would you call what we did, you and I? It was a counseling session, correct? Kind of. Yeah. Where, where, where kind of, you know, I was getting the info from you, all the intel, right? What's the real story? Like what happened, how it happened, et cetera, et cetera. And then obviously from my side, what I was doing is what I'm good at is my intuition muscle, you know, different, I mean, psychic is an overrated word, but yeah, I have a very high, strong intuition muscle. And um, all I did was I really used that muscle for finding out some more information as to what are the, areas that's blocking your relationship with her right right and and basically i could do that using some of the cool techniques in my basket you know whether it's reiki or some cool uh, you know techniques from my india land there are lots of healing techniques are in the basket like pranic healing i don't know so what i'm saying is it's, it's, it was more about it was more about understanding the other person's uh, resentment towards you correct her mm -hmm. resentment towards you and and, and the reasons behind it and, and trying to get both your vibes, or both your, I guess, energies a little bit calmer. So actually even you guys can talk and try to resolve things, right? So. Well, and it was yeah, amazing because you were up in Ottawa. I was here in LA. So for those listening, it's not like Manali was here and all three of us were in a room. I hadn't talked to her in a month. I mean, the girl I'm in question, Manali was in Ottawa. And so Manali, you know, by getting some information from me, was able to give me some really incredible insight on what that girl was thinking, even though Manali hadn't asked her or talked to her. Um, like, I remember you told me, you know, you you need to do this and that. She's kind of th thinking this at this point. One of her friends is talking into her ear about maybe just forgetting yeah. it. Yeah. And I think it, I think it actually ended up being true. Everything you said was actually true, you know, and you would have no way of knowing that. And I sure as hell wouldn't. You know what energy doesn't lie that's the bottom line energy talks energy travels so so yes one of the biggest uh, gifts i have is i can actually tap into a person person's uh, chakras or energy centers even at a distance right and get some intel get some create some calmness and relaxation that uh, that anxiety reduce it you know to actually have the two people calmly figure things out whether whether it's going to be resolved or not is not in the hands but you know, sending some positivity towards that relationship, right? That's what uh, uh, energy healing can do. And I mean, that's what I tried, to be honest, that time to to, to really uh, under understand what she was thinking and then pass that, those insights to you so you can actually act accordingly, right? right? Things got resolved. I'm so happy for, for you guys, seriously. Yeah. You know, everything worked out. And uh, yeah, that was years ago. But uh, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was really useful, right? So... I didn't know what special techniques you're using, but now you kind of explained it. Now, when you d you do something like that, whether it's with me or somebody else, and you you said you're giving energy to calm a situation down, you know, as an empath, I get drained all the time with clients, and you know, they always leave my office saying they feel great, I'm so calming, and I end up often feeling very, very tired. So, when you do something like that, does it drain your energy? Like, are you giving your energy away in that sense and feeling drained afterwards, or not? No, actually, in the beginning, in my, you know, early, uh, when I was 18, 19, 20, whatever, I was just starting off practicing all this technique, I used to feel drained out because it was my energy I was literally giving away, right? And it is also connected to how grounded I am, you know, like how much my roots are in the soil, right? That's important in any energy healing. 
But but no, I don't get drained out, and I think it's practice again. And what happens is I just tap into the energy, the cosmic energy or the universal energy, and I'm I'm just like a tube, you know, I'm like a channel, and the energy just travels through me with that intention for that person or the client, and and that's it. So I keep my personal reserves aside. I keep my personal stuff aside, actually, and I'm just simply there, you know, with a pure uh, position of just love, life for that person. And and that's it. And, and that's how it works. You know, the minute we get our personal stuff in, I mean, as a healer, I'm saying, um, you get drained out. Well, so how do you, do you have to have, I mean, I know you talked about getting your energy supply from the universal and what have you, but do you not have some sort of release you have to do? Like for me, it's my traveling, like doing my solo traveling, working on this podcast. I just shut myself out and that's kind of how I recover my energy. But like, do you have some sort of release, like watch movies? Like what's your, what's your way of rebalancing yourself? Or are you suggesting you don't need to do that because you're tapped in, more tapped in? Of course not. Of course, No, no, I do need to do that. Definitely. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm a human. I do need to do that. Let's get that really clear. And I, I'll tell you what I do normally, okay? I love watching Bollywood movies, like Bollywood channel, okay? It just mm-hmm. takes me to my land, India. And I think it just relaxes me. It's kind of sometimes really funny or doesn't make any sense sometimes. And that's perfect for me because I get li- I get very relaxed and I'm just watching TV for some time. That's one. I think also my daily practices are almost like critical for me. It's not, a, it's not like I have a choice because this is my line of work. So usually, you know, whether it's my daily meditation, I do some journaling uh, daily. Um, I do some self-healing on myself. So, you know, I, I, I work on my own energy blanket or my chakras, energy centers, all that. So, so yes, it is, it is work. Like I daily invest a substantial amount of time inside of my work appointments and my family commitments on Manali time. It's important because if I don't do that, then yes, exactly as you said, I will drained out. I will not be grounded and I'll start using my personal energy reserves. So yes, it's like brushing your teeth, you know? And I and honestly, when I'm coaching people, I tell that line or example a lot. You know, it's not like we brush our teeth once in 10 days, right? They need daily maintenance. We need to clean. I mean, yeah, some days we might brush them beautifully. We might floss. We might take a long time. But the fact is we daily maintain our teeth and i think maintaining our own energies maintaining our own grounding and all that basically it's daily work man that's that's what it is it's daily work and i think i'm got used to it and i feel great doing it and i definitely encourage people like gotta gotta do something daily that's it well and by the way everybody like she knows what she's talking about because manali looks like her daughter's younger sister so you know, stress you, stress ages people. What was that, Vanali? I said that's very nice of you to say that. Oh, Thank I'm sure you. everybody tells you that. I mean, where stress kind of ages you after practicing law for a number of years, I saw the premature grays coming. You know what's interesting about that? Now that I've been chilling out for the last few months, I swear to God, some a lot of my gray hair is actually growing black again. I don't know if that's actually happening, but I'm pretty sure it is. But my point being, it just shows you how stress can really tackle you and so if you're if you're brushing your teeth or in this case brushing your brain like manali's t- saying it can definitely keep you looking refreshed and younger because i don't think it's a coincidence manali thinks the way she does and you know looks like ha- like less than half of her age i i agree with you to that some point because you know what daily daily practices of, of just being positive a little bit you know whatever we can do spiritual is one side but just daily something uh, definitely helps our, our body getting better messages, right? The cells in our body, uh, right right from, you know, how our organs are functioning. Every, everything gets that happy energy, you know what I mean? And the stress reduces. And uh, I think at the end of the day, less the stress, the better we look, uh, the better we feel. And you know, that's just the way it, it rolls, you know, better on our energy. So you're right, actually, yeah. Well, so tell us a little bit about uh, how your Reiki healing because that's a lot to do with that has a lot to do with reiki right healing have you had any instances that you could share with us obviously you know keeping your clients anonymous could you share us a story that you may have where your ability or you've used reiki to actually see a tangible result in in terms of healing somebody where western medicine couldn't 
actually, you know what? I'm, I, yeah, I'm remembering this uh, this a case I had. You know, this was about uh, maybe three years back. And this this was a person who got indirectly referred to me through a doctor from from the local hospital here from Ottawa. And this patient used to uh, so basically the patient had gone as an you know as an emergency right to the hospital uh, at least four to five times because he had a chest pain like almost like a heart attack angina you know like a clear cut heart attack pain. And he went to the hospital multiple times, and each time, you know, they they used to send him back. But, uh, and eventually, they said, "Okay, let's do let's get you fully assessed." So the doctor assessed this person, right? All blood tests were normal. His ECG stress test was done. Everything was normal. Like his heart had no problems. And this doctor was really disappointed because he couldn't come to any conclusion. I mean, what's going on? Because the patient was still coming every alternate weeks as an as an emergency, you know, ad- admission. So anyway, I think the doctor must have talked to his wife, who was really, a, you know, she believed in me. And she suggested to him that, hey, why don't you send this patient to Manali? You know, I, I can give you, I can give you her email. And so anyway, so the patient came to me. Uh, and uh, the first time when I saw this person, he was, he was an angry, grumpy man, like sitting in front of me. And he absolutely didn't believe in what I do. So he was sitting there and looking at me skeptically. Um, so long story short, what happened is, as I started giving him sessions, you know, so I told him that he needs to at least see me twice a week, time four weeks, okay, for him to actually see some results. Now, as the treatment began, I realized this person had a heavy emotional baggage. In my language, you know, I say that his chest area, which there's a little energy center called the heart chakra okay it's all a center of emotions where we store a lot of things anyway so this guy's area that chest entire chest was tight so from for me the biggest uh, you know goal was to get his release happening like let him like make him speak what is really bothering him and after a few sessions he started a little bit you know trusting me a little bit more and he started sharing his story so here was what, what the scoop was that this man had left his house, you know, had a fight with his father at the age of 20, okay? And when he, like right now in the present time, when he came to me, he must be at least about 58, 60 years old, this, this, uh, this gentleman, okay? And he had not talked to his father or met his dad for the, like almost, what, 30 plus years. And I think he was feeling guilty somewhere down the line because he didn't he didn't know if his father was alive, dead. How how was how was he? And he was carrying that burden on his on his heart chakra. So after a few sessions, I told him, I coached him. I said, "Listen, you got to get that off your chest. Why don't you find out where your father is? Just do some research, talk to people." And I think around maybe it was seventh session, right? Almost was like almost like an end of the month was happening with his treatment. He finally found out information that his dad was in an old age age home somewhere, you know, outside the city. And he met him and his father could not recognize him. Like he had Alzheimer's and and zero memory, but he had a completion with him. He, He hugged his dad. He said, sorry. He said, I'm sorry, I, I didn't at all, you know, take care of you, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And he had this emotional release. He cried like a baby in front of his dad. And I'm telling you, that crying this old man did was the most beautiful healing he could do for himself, you know. And, of course, he came back, and I concluded his, his treatment because his pain vanished. The day he met his father, within a week, his chest pain had completely gone. Like completely, like just poof, gone. And he met the doctor again, the same doctor from the hospital, to thank him for referring me him to me. And and the doctor emailed me. I still remember that. And he said, "I have no idea what you did, but this is fascinating, and I want to come and try a session with you." And now that doctor is my regular client, and and he uh, he still keeps referring me people with such psychosomatic disorders, he likes to call it, where medical medical explanations are not existing. People's symptoms are there, but everything seems normal. 
or treatments are given to patients, but there's no response, right? So, so you know, sometimes it's say, you know, they say mind over matter. Things are beyond, they're beyond some certain explanations and it's deep down rooted within us. I guess. So, yeah, it was a very exciting experience for me to see him exit my basket, my nest, this patient, and I'm still in touch with him. He still comes, you know, occasionally for his maintenance or a checkup sessions with me, and uh, he's doing really well. Yeah. Wow, that's a good story. And, you know, it's, it's true. I really think, I don't know if you've heard of uh, this author, Louise Hay. Have you ever heard of her? She's brilliant. She she was a cancer. She's a cancer survivor, right? And uh, right, yeah. she healed. She healed herself. Yeah. And and you know, she. I remember her talking about. I know she passed not that long ago, but she was talking about how she had been, you know, sexually abused and what have you. And her cancer, obviously, not obviously, but her cancer ended up being related to her reproductive organs because since she had been sexually abused or raped, she ha- somehow deep inside she held a hatred that manifested itself into cancer. So it 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 became cancer of that part of her, her body, obviously. So it is, it's amazing. Humans are kind of like scorpions. I always remember this. I think it wasn't, it wasn't totally an Indian movie, but it, it took place in India. This is decades ago. I think it was, oh man, I'll have to remember the name of it. But in any event, I remember there's this one scene in this kind of Indian movie. It was about this Indian guy that fell in love with this British girl. It's back from like late eighties. And I remember at one point, okay. what's up? No, I'm just trying to remember the name of the movie, actually. I'm yeah, but I think I know what you're talking. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like the movie Romancing the Stone, but it's not. It's like, I'll, I'll find it. But in what, there's a scene where this kid is, you know, quote unquote, playing with a scorpion. And it's a real scorpion, like a big one. And he takes the, the str- <laughs> string and he lights the string on fire. And he puts it around the scorpion. So the scorpion's trapped. And what the scorpion does is it takes its own stinger and it kills itself. Like it, it, it stinger from the back reaches forward and it basically stings itself to die because it's surrounded by fire. And I think about humans because while humans commit suicide for, in different manners, what a lot of people don't realize mm-hmm. is through their negative thoughts, they're killing themselves all the time, right? This guy, because what do you think would have happened? Just, I, know, I don't know if you're allowed to speculate in your industry, but if people don't heal these tra- these hidden traumas they have or these things that they're holding in their heart or their head, what do you think happens to them? Do they just develop cancer like Louise Hay or what, what, what's the end result usually? The first end result is, I mean, the first result is they're not living their life fully because every day they are a little bit in the depression mode, right? Like they're not able to enjoy relationships in their life. They, they get burnt out very fast. That's first immediate deficit, you know, or the outcome. And, and yes, uh, the, the deeper outcomes are diseases. Like, you know, I, I, lo- I love to believe in the line of work I do is I'm more like a prevention, you know, prevention healer, okay? Which means I, I love when people come to me at the early stages. Like, okay, Manali, I'm stressed out, okay? Or Manali, my neck is hurting. Some tiny things like that, right? Or Manali, I'm a little depressed. Or, I, I, you know, I had a breakup in this relationship. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling heavy. I'm feeling sad. These are beautiful initial, I like to say, ages, okay? But when people just keep, overloading themselves and don't know how to empty their emotions, it immediately, as you said, it leads to bigger things like diseases. You know, like I have women who have been having some, you know, past tense issues, clients, you know, where abuses have happened or childhood traumas have happened and they all have reproductive system issues, uterus, this, that, whatever that is, right? And deeper, deeper diseases are cancers and uh, you know, tumors. And so, yeah, it's all preventive is what I believe. It, it begins, you just need to be aware about it and go figure it out and get it handled. And if if you can't get the, the I guess, the solution through the, the conventional techniques, then yes, you got to get out of the box, like just like you did that time. You were not a full believer, but you decided to step out of the box and try something new and it worked. So, you know, it, it's all about, Stepping out outside, outside the box is what I feel and prevent all these things from happening. It's possible. Yeah. Because I believe everything is reversible as long as it's done at the right time. True. Yeah. And I, you know, there's definitely been an awakening over the last 10 to 15 years where people are now more open to the idea of looking at what used to be alternative methods are just becoming an, another legitimate method. So, you know, people go to the hospital with some illness and, you know, they're, they're thrown you know, pills are thrown at them. And 
you know, I have very limited experience with doctors, but my knowledge of them is no offense to them or anything. They're, they're basically trained to follow a flow chart in their head that usually ends up with pill A, pill B, or pill C. And there's very little, and there are very, there are very few to- doctors here in the West where they discuss, they go further than, okay, well, how do you feel mentally? Have you been going through a stressful time right now? There's very little of that. Like, like I remember when I was in my teens, I had some, I developed some acne and I had amazing skin before that. And I never really figured it out. And back then, unfortunately, they didn't really have all these great treatments that they have now for acne. And like, you don't even need to really have it if you don't want to. But, you know, I didn't really know what was causing it. I didn't even think about what was causing it. It was just basically, hey, you're a teen- teenager, you have raging hormones, you're going to get some acne. But as I've gotten, you know, that subsided after, I guess, two years. Uh, but as I grew up, what I found is when I've gone through really stressful times, I'll suddenly get a, a big pimple or something like that. Even this is two, over two decades later, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a fully grown, grown man. So I'm like, well, when I think about it, it's like, well, when I was in high school or whatever, I mean, high school had a great time. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, you have stressful things happening at home and you, you're, you're not as in control of your emotions when things happen like you are now. And I, I kind of think that when I had acne back then, it was because I was getting stressed out all the time. And, you know, now, now for me, if I'm not paying attention and I get a, the second I see any sort of pimple, I'm like, okay, I got to take a, I got to take a breather. What's stressing me out? Uh, because your body's always going to try to communicate with you more and more until you finally listen. Right. So if that means stopping you with a really major illness, that it's going to do that. Right. Okay. So. Well, Manali, you know what? It's been great. I, I want to have you back. There's so much we didn't talk about. I, I want to talk to you about crystals and burning sage and things like that, because I always make fun of that stuff on the show. Uh, we're running out of time for today's episode, so it would, I'd love to have you back if you're open to it. Looking forward to be back, actually. Yeah, awesome. So okay, fun. well, it's been great. I hope our, crowd, our audience has enjoyed uh, the talk today. You guys have learned a little bit about Reiki, and you're going to learn a hell of a lot more as Manali and I keep chatting. So Manali, do you just want to tell the audience your, your website again, so they can go visit it to learn a bit more about you and Reiki? The website is uh, zenforyou.ca. So it's Z-E-N-F-O-R-Y-O-U dot C-A. And if you guys are on social media, I do a lot of daily motivational stuff. And my handle for Instagram is uh, zen for you, my business name, Inc. So I-N-C. And the same thing for my Facebook page, Zen for You Inc. So hope to uh, say uh, see you there and uh, just say hi to me if you find me. Awesome, and, and for you Americans or Americans listening out there, when Manali says Z, that's Canadian for the letter Z. So it's Z E N for you. Uh, uh, dot thank you. Thank you for that yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining All us, right. Manali, and uh, can't wait to have you back. And we'll keep uh, we'll keep unraveling the subject. Thanks for having me over and uh, namaste to all of you. All right. See you guys on the next one. Thanks again for tuning in to the Everglow, chronicling my life as an empath as I travel the globe. Check us out on Instagram at N-E-I-L-B-H-A-R-T-I-A for more photos related to this and other podcasts.